I love the fact that we were talking to Grant and now we're talking to you because obviously you guys are business partners, you know each other well, but you sort of come at it from a different perspective. He, I, I don't think you were on the Duke National Championship team. I well, I might have been, but I wasn't getting playing time. <laughs> no, no, I, I, um, I don't think we, we came. I think we had different paths to the NBA. I yeah, exactly. I think, that's, um, I think that's fair to say. But you did end up in the NBA and have been, you know, a, a very successful owner in the league. You came in at a time when people were like, yeah, NBA, like pretty good investment. Now it's probably one of the hottest investments going. Um, as you look at the landscape, Let's just start with sort of what sports are worth right now. What do you think? I mean, it, it, it feels like trees seem to be growing to the sky. Well, uh, I think it's a, a much larger asset class than most of the marketplace, most of the financial marketplace gives its cre give, give it credit for, if you will. But uh, one of the points Grant didn't make, and sometimes uh, everyone comes at valuations differently. When, when we looked at buying the Hawks and, and did in fact buy the Hawks together. Uh, Grant, I think, was even more bullish and actually wanted to put up more money mm. into what this asset was and could be. And I was still at that time very much focused on the fact that it was losing money yeah. on an operating basis. I was trying to counsel Grant, uh, I think, to his uh, great misfortune to put up less money because losing, you know, businesses that lose money have much more risk than you might appreciate. Um, he had a view of where this industry and business was going. He was actually more right than wrong. Yeah. Um, and he's never really held me up on that and probably should. <laughs> the, the truth of the matter is uh, many of these, uh, as Grant actually mentioned, a lot of these businesses and industries um, and certainly leagues and teams have gone through this massive evolution. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it takes a long time for leagues and franchises to make money to show the valuation that, that the market is now seeing. Um, and, and yes, uh, your point earlier, this is an asset class, uh, we at Aries would argue, I don't know, two and a half, three trillion dollar asset class. Wow. And people take a step back and say, well, what are you even saying? Uh, if you think about the NFL, uh, there's 32 franchises. Average franchises, maybe five or six billion dollars. So 150, 160 billion, 180 billion uh, of value in just franchises. And each of those franchises has all sorts of ancillary businesses, from stadiums to real estate developments, uh, technology related businesses, uh, retail and, and food and beverage related businesses. So uh, when people say, uh, what is the size of this industry? I would argue at least most folks looking at it are woefully underestimating the value of this sports world globally. Yeah. Uh, so when people take a step back and say, wow, <laughs> um, this is a really meaningful asset class. And frankly, it's an asset class that's not just for rich people. Yeah. Uh, it's an asset class for investors trying to, uh, now investors that hopefully do real work and understand the difference some leagues are really nascent, really early in their, in their uh, journey, if you will. Um, and some leagues are, are really comfortably seeing each of their franchises make meaningful cash flow. So there is analysis required, but the size and scope and excitement of this industry is a little bit greater than most folks might have anticipated. Yeah, and I, there's so much to unpack in, in what you just said. But before we get too far from valuations, I want to put a poll up, um, if we can, because we want to ask the audience what they think about, uh, I think, US, sport, US sports teams' valuations. So this is sort of a Goldilocks question. <laughs> Are they too low, just right, too high, or sky high and ridiculous? Um, <laughs> I might wait to see what the audience says before I ask you um, if they agree. But you know, we've, we've shown up on the screen here. I mean, these are, it's not quite, I, you know, to use the tired old term, hockey stick, but it's pretty close when you look at NBA valuations, you know, your, um, your friends in Los Angeles, you know, Willow Bay and Bob Iger just bought the NWSL team, as was mentioned, uh, out there, Angel City, for $250 million valuation. Mate, that's, that's real money uh, for women's soccer. All right, so here's what the audience says. Just Right takes it with 39% and growing, 40%. Too high, sky high and ridiculous, and they're not too low. So it, it, it seems like the audience is agreeing with you. How, 
How do you? How does this play out in the near and midterm? And how do you, as an investor, think about it? Well, well firstly, it's so hard, at least in my mind, uh, to answer a question like that because sure. each of the leagues and each of the franchises have enormous. Uh, uh, differences sure. in, in what they're doing. Uh, those teams that really have a global or the ability to have a global following, uh, those uh, leagues and those sports that actually incorporate or expect to incorporate sports betting uh, and therefore increasing the, the obsession of young people into their sport have advantages. Uh, those that have uh, really a huge amounts of, of cachet and stars that can attract global media rights. Uh, these are things that distinguish, I think, uh, the long-term winners versus uh, there may not be as many losers as uh, people might argue, uh, but there'll be some. Yeah. There'll be some that aren't extraordinary and that aren't global and phenomenally valuable sports and sports franchises. So I kind of go by sport. Yeah. Um, and yes, I, I do believe at the end of the day, Global media rights is something that uh, that you have to aspire to. Yeah. Um, and yes, I'm being a little partial to, to the NBA, or but but there are uh, so many uh, additional ancillary values that come from a global following. Right. Right. Uh, so to me, sports are not uh, a single entity. Sure. Um, and one of the things we would argue is understanding uh, the benefits uh, and detriments of not just the sport but of the market that they play in yes. and of the league that they operate in. And uh, uh, I don't want to disparage a certain city versus another, but uh, if you're the 30th largest metro in America right. versus the first, second, or third, or even the top 10, dramatic difference. Um, so uh, again, that, that too is awfully relevant, not just the league and the sport. Well, and it's interesting. So, so let's talk about that in a little more depth because um, as you know, and maybe some of the folks here know, I'm from Atlanta, so we've spent a lot of time talking about um, Atlanta sports, the Atlanta experience, and everything that's going on there. It's a fascinating economy, as you know, um, as well as anyone, although it feels like it's something you learned very quickly once you became a, a, the owner of the, of the team. You have now embarked on a very ambitious project in downtown Atlanta trying to do something that anyone who's paid attention to the history of Atlanta has been one of the most intractable problems, which is revitalizing downtown. Talk to us about what you're doing, because I believe it, you know, we love size and scope and superlatives here at Bloomberg. <laughs> it's the biggest or one of the biggest, say, projects of its kind in the country right now. Well, uh, again, I've now uh, owned the Atlanta Hawks for 10 years, and downtown Atlanta, well, let's start with uh, the positives, which is Metro Atlanta is booming. Yeah. And six or 6.2 million or 6.4 million of population, uh, enormous economy, the, the capital of the southeastern United States. So everything is extraordinarily positive when you talk about Metro Atlanta. And for whatever reasons, and there's a whole bunch, but downtown Atlanta hasn't really uh, developed in the way an extraordinary metropolis like Atlanta should have. And one of the reasons is there happens to be 50 acres in the middle of it uh, that, literally, that literally is subterranean, underground with railroad tracks, and has been so difficult, so difficult to develop. So uh, over the past 10 years, literally since the time we bought the team, we knew that really to transform the area and to really build something where people want to come two hours before, stay two hours later. Uh, you had to develop downtown. Before and after a game. Before and after a game, yeah. I'm sorry. So uh, at the end of the day, we, didn't, we weren't uh, absolutely committed to the fact that we had to do what we are doing. It's called Centennial Yards. We're building uh, at least 6 million square feet. Uh, it'll be a million square feet of retail, 4,000, 5,000 apartments, a half a million square foot entertainment district. Uh, it, it really is going to transform downtown Atlanta. And don't forget, when we just bought the team, the Atlanta Braves had just moved out to Cobb County, right. which for those that don't know, Atlanta, you know, a suburb of Atlanta, uh, they did a beautiful job developing the battery and right. credit to the Atlanta Braves organization, but it didn't help downtown Atlanta and it left a hole, as you will. So w we were determined uh, to really stay in downtown Atlanta, refurbish the State Farm Arena and really develop downtown and hopefully transform uh, the city of Atlanta. 
Um, and ultimately, and, uh, it's good for business. I mean, it's good for your business no question. as the Hawks, right? No question. And, and again, when we talk about uh, the size of the sports media world, right. uh, there isn't a meaningful sports franchise that I know of. <laughs> and I must have gotten uh, at least 30 calls from different team owners just about what are we doing in downtown Atlanta. Mm. Because virtually everyone wants to take advantage of this phenomenon of live, work, and play. Right in a downtown environment, um, but, but the idea of creating life around your arena, because many times arenas and stadiums are built in uh, less than ideal locations because the land is cheaper. Right. So uh, you have a situation where that community has not developed in the way it should. So we're, we're, we think we're changing that. Uh, we're not there yet, but I, I'll tell you this, we, we have enormous momentum. Uh, and I, I do believe that downtown Atlanta is going to be transformed, and I do believe it'll be better for our business, but much more importantly, and I do mean this much more importantly, it's going to transform the, uh, the metro Atlanta region. Well, and, and you have seen you know, other teams do this in some form or fashion. You know, obviously, the Deer District in, in Milwaukee Lake has, has helped oh, that. Yeah. I mean, it's not quite as ambitious as what you're doing. You see it happen. Um, What's the downside? What's the risk? Is the risk just the risk that comes with a massive real estate development? Uh, the risk that most people didn't want to appreciate. The risk is losing all your money. Yeah. And at the end of the day, uh, I think that's, that. uh, that's a risk that all of us, uh, at least that invested in this development, uh, chose to take. And uh, again, the battery was an example. The Atlanta Braves developed an incredible uh, development right attached to their stadium uh, that's both uh, office, that's uh, uh, retail office, uh, fantastic, fantastic development. But th this is a bit larger. Uh, I would say that uh, the, the, the 4,000 apartments and bringing uh, real life to downtown Atlanta is something that uh, I think the community is looking forward to. And, and I do think is uh, uh, the rising tide lifting all yeah. boats is a fairly good uh, analogy here. It's, it's, yeah. it's going to help downtown and we're excited. And with a little bit of luck, we'll do okay on the investment. Um, as I promised Grant and to me as well, that I thought it would do well. They're big investors with us, so uh, we, we do think it's going to do pretty well. Uh, but more importantly, we do think it's going to change the way people perceive downtown Atlanta. And so one of the things that's involved in both what you're talking about and this you know, massive total addressable market for sports globally is more money, more money coming to this. There has been a massive movement of institutional capital into sports that we have seen. Most recently, last week, the NFL, you know, being sort of the last major league in the United States to allow institutional capital in on a very, you know, specific basis. How important was that move? And how important is institutional capital broadly coming in? And I'm asking this of someone who, you know, helped build the modern, you know, alternative investment world. Well, uh, I'm wearing so many hats on this answer, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at Aries, uh, as the chairman of Aries, we are huge believers in the investing, lending uh, to sports, to sports franchises, to leagues, to development. So it, it's an important business for us. And, and we have, uh, I think we recognize somewhat early that this is a massive asset class and bigger than, as I said earlier, bigger than most folks probably appreciate. But the NFL, uh, let's not kid ourselves, what is it someone said, if you own a day of the week, you're a pretty important sports league. <laughs> and uh, the NFL is extraordinary in everything they have done. Uh, the success speaks for itself. And the, the NFL being the last, but certainly embracing institutional capital, it just acknowledges the obvious. Uh, the valuations, uh, the complexity of some of these businesses, of how they are growing ancillary businesses, it just uh, makes it a better business to have institutional capital and folks hopefully that are uh, somewhat expert in investing, whether in uh, dead instruments or uh, preferred stock instruments or pure common, but understanding minority investment capabilities with expertise to make them better businesses. Right. Uh, maybe not better businesses in the core what's on the field, but quite possibly better businesses in what's off the field, what's across in a development or ancillary activity. So uh, it's something that the NFL, I think, recognized uh, under the, the commercial. I guess the Aries being one of the three or four that they've accepted is a I think a great testament what we've been trying to do. Yeah. I mean, and, and I guess, and I am asking you to wear various hats on, on this answer, but I'll push you a little further, which is this notion of, you know, you went in to the Hawks 
as a private citizen, you know, someone who had obviously been very successful in the, you know, private capital world, it is a different thing for an individual or a family to come in and say, okay, we're going to invest in this. And an institutional fund who is investing, as they would tell you, as you would tell this audience, on behalf of firefighters and teachers and public pensions, et cetera, at college endowments, that is a, that's a massive endorsement, it feels like, in the potential growth of the sports world. Is that a fair assessment? Well, uh, again, each was, uh, when I bought the, the Atlanta Hawks, I thought it was a, a, an interesting asset that was losing money that could be run better. Um, and uh, I learned a whole lot over the last 10 years, no question. But I thought it was a decent personal investment, hedge against inflation, if you will, something that would at least hold its value. But over the 10 years, uh, I must say, I, what, I, what I did recognize is not just that the asset class is much bigger, but that most of the teams and leagues need help mm. to be run better. Most of these companies, believe it or not, most of these franchises were small family companies. And as the valuations have grown so dramatically, uh, they need more professional expertise. And, and they've been getting it. And yeah. you're seeing a professionalization, if that's the right word, uh, of how these leagues and teams are run. And again, under the category of a team is worth uh, five or six hundred million dollars ten years ago but five or six billion today as you can appreciate it has to be run differently right and uh, i think you're seeing all of that happen in the last ten years and i think you're absolutely going to continue to see that over the next ten years and bringing institutional capital i'm not saying it always makes a team run better right. or a league run better but it can offer insights, it can offer best practices, it can offer experiences that we've had with other teams and other leagues that uh, certain franchises or commissioners yeah. or league investors could say, wow, I could benefit from that. I mean, it's interesting, too, as you think about, you know, the, the broadening of ownership, not just from institutions, but, you know, as people get into sort of... Um, less mature leagues, the NWSL, you know, being a good example of that, but, you know, lots of other things going on. I would imagine people come to you for your advice on, like, not just how do I invest, but, you know, once I'm an owner, what do I do? What do you tell them? Well, um, again, it's kind of like parenting. There's a whole lot of ways uh, to win championships, and, and we haven't won one uh, <laughs> since I've won. So the fact that uh, maybe I shouldn't be giving the advice. Um, but uh, there is all about winning a championship, and there's all about running your business better. Right. I actually think we've been a little bit better at the latter, uh, but we're similarly focused, I promise, on the former. Uh, but listen. One of the things I do say, and it does come back to what I mentioned earlier about when we first looked at the Hawks, when, when you're used to looking at assets and businesses based on multiples of cash flow and expected cash flow growth, the sports world uh, quite often uh, can be a, a complicated uh, analysis for people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do try to argue in certain leagues, again, certain leagues, certain franchises, you do have to utilize almost that infrastructure type mentality where this should be a long lived, relatively low risk investment in the right league, in the right market, with the right franchise. I believe that emphatically. All right. In other leagues that are uh, much, much more uh, young in their life cycle, it's a whole different game, and it's yeah. a very much a venture-like investment, and you should approach it that way. Right. So, uh, again, I, I try not to, to use that single brush stroke, right. but in certain businesses, certain leagues, certain uh, franchises, uh, this is an infrastructure-like investment, and your rate of return should be lower. Yeah. Because I think the safety of the asset is pretty extraordinary in many cases. Yeah. Um, so be so as we wrap up, you know, Grant did a really nice job of describing sort of what's happening in the, in the global game of basketball. Obviously, he has a role in that. You also have a, a role in that as an owner of a, an NBA franchise, as someone who, you know, has drafted international players just recently. What happens next with the global growth of the NBA? What does it look like to, to really sort of level up in, in that regard? Oh, I, I think, again, following Grant is not the ideal move here either, I might add, but basketball is a global sport, and yeah. what the NBA is doing and what the league office is so 
talented at doing is that international PR. And uh, not just USA Basketball, which is a huge part of what's going on in the sport, not just the NBA, but you're going to see extraordinary things, I, I really believe, happen in NBA China, in NBA Europe, in what will be uh, a European right. uh, basketball league at some point, in NBA Africa. Y you have all of this global growth and interest. And I think, again, to Grant's earlier point, it's driven by the excitement that's on the court in the NBA. Yeah. And these 30 franchises need to have superstars and extraordinary play which they do to grow the sport globally, I, I think they're doing just that. Um, I'm not saying it's the only sport doing it, but it's, it's one of the, uh, I think on, on one hand, you could count what sports have true, uh, genuine global opportunities because of uh, the excitement it has created in its home. And, and I'd say the NBA is one of them.